Have you ever reached for a tiny pink packet of Sweet and Low to sweeten your coffee or tea? That little sachet might seem like a modern invention from a health conscious era, but its story actually begins over a century ago by complete accident. It involves chemistry, a curious scientist who didn't wash his hands, and a revolution in the way we think about sugar. Today, we're diving into the surprising and often controversial history of saccharin, the artificial sweetener behind Sweet and Low. From lab benches to World War shortages, from diet trends to FDA drama, this tiny molecule has stirred up big conversations. Let's peel back the pink wrapper and discover how saccharin went from lab fluke to a staple in millions of homes, right here on History of Simple Things. The story of saccharin starts in 1879 at Johns Hopkins University, where a young Russian-American chemist named Konstantin Falberg was working in the lab of Professor Ira Remsen. Falberg was studying coal tar derivatives. Yes, coal tar, the sticky black stuff used in paving roads and waterproofing. One evening, after a long day at the lab, Falberg sat down to eat without washing his hands. To his surprise, the bread he picked up tasted unusually sweet. Curious, he began tasting the items on the table, trying to trace the source of the sweetness. But it wasn't the food. It was his own fingers. Rushing back to the lab, Falberg traced the sweetness to a compound he had been working on, benzoic sulfamide. He had discovered the world's first artificial sweetener entirely by accident. Remsen and Falberg published their findings, but soon after, Falberg patented saccharin without including Remsen's name. This caused a serious falling out between the two scientists, and Remsen never forgave Falberg for taking sole credit for the discovery. Despite the drama behind its discovery, saccharin didn't make immediate waves. It took a few decades before the public started noticing it. In the early 1900s, sugar was still king. People didn't see a need for artificial substitutes, but saccharin found a niche market among diabetics who couldn't process sugar safely. Doctors began recommending it as a sugar alternative, and pharmaceutical companies began to produce it in small amounts. Then came World War I. Sugar shortages swept across the globe. Suddenly, an inexpensive, long-lasting sugar substitute seemed like a very good idea. Saccharin use exploded. It was cheap to produce, calorie-free, and incredibly sweet, about 300 to 500 times sweeter than regular sugar. It was during this time that the U.S. government began taking more interest in food safety. In 1906, the Pure Food and Drug Act was passed, and the government started regulating what went into processed foods. Saccharin quickly became a point of controversy. In the early 1900s, none other than President Theodore Roosevelt became involved in the saccharin debate. After the new food safety laws were put into place, Dr. Harvey Wiley, head of the Bureau of Chemistry, which later became the FDA, wanted saccharin banned. He believed that it was a dangerous chemical and didn't belong in the food supply. But Roosevelt, who had been using saccharin himself to reduce his sugar intake, wasn't having it. He famously said, anybody who says saccharin is injurious to health is an idiot. And with that presidential endorsement, saccharin stayed on the market. That moment was critical. It not only kept saccharin in the spotlight, but also shaped the way artificial sweeteners were treated by the public and the government for decades to come. Saccharin quietly remained in use for much of the early 20th century, but its real breakthrough came in the 1950s and 1960s, when diet culture began to take off. America was entering a new era of processed foods, calorie counting, and weight-conscious living. In 1957, a company called Cumberland Packing Corporation introduced Sweet and Low. The name came from a poem by Alfred Lord Tennyson, and the packaging, those now iconic pink packets, was chosen to stand out. 
the product quickly became a hit in diners, restaurants, and coffee shops across the country. What made Sweet and Low unique was not just its use of saccharin, but also the way it was marketed. Instead of focusing on diabetics or people with medical needs, it was sold as a lifestyle product for anyone who wanted to have sweetness without the guilt. It was perfect for the new wave of diet sodas, low-calorie desserts, and sugar-free everything. Saccharin, once a medical oddity, had gone mainstream. But saccharin's rise was not without turbulence. In the 1970s, a Canadian study found that lab rats developed bladder cancer after being fed high doses of saccharin. Public concern grew quickly, and in 1977, the U.S. Congress mandated that all products containing saccharin carry a warning label stating, This product contains saccharin, which has been determined to cause cancer in laboratory animals. It was a major blow to the artificial sweetener industry. While the FDA did not ban saccharin, the warning label stuck around for years and made consumers think twice about those pink packets. However, the scientific community wasn't unanimous. Later research showed that the way rats metabolized saccharin was different from humans, and the cancer risk didn't seem to apply to people. After decades of review, the National Toxicology Program officially removed saccharin from its list of potential carcinogens in 2000. The warning labels were dropped soon after. Today, saccharin is just one of many artificial sweeteners on the market. It competes with sucralose, used in Splenda, aspartame, used in Equal, and newer plant-based options like stevia and monk fruit extract. Each has its own fan base and its own controversy. Though saccharin isn't as dominant as it once was, it's still used in some diet drinks, toothpaste, and, of course, in sweet and low. It remains popular in certain parts of the world and continues to be a go-to option for people looking to cut back on sugar. And while newer sweeteners might grab more headlines, Saccharin holds the unique title of being the first artificial sweetener ever discovered, and one that survived more than a century of scientific scrutiny, public skepticism, and shifting cultural attitudes. Saccharin's story is more than just chemistry. It's a story about how we adapt. It was born out of curiosity, spread because of war and scarcity, and stuck around because of our changing views on health and sugar. It forced society to ask questions we're still debating today. What is natural? What is healthy? Can something artificial be better than something real? It also helped open the door to the idea that sweetness doesn't have to come with consequences. While nutritionists still debate the best approach to sugar and sugar substitutes, there's no denying saccharin changed the landscape of food forever. Artificial sweeteners are now part of everyday life. Whether you use them or avoid them, saccharin started it all with one unwashed hand and a surprisingly sweet bite of bread. So the next time you tear open a pink packet of sweet and low, remember the long journey that tiny crystal of saccharin took. From coal tar experiments to diner tables across America, its story is one of science, scandal, and sweet success. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this dive into the history of saccharin and sweet and low, be sure to like, subscribe, and hit the bell so you won't miss more simple stories with extraordinary backstories. Thank you for joining us on this journey through the history of simple things. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and stay tuned for more stories woven through the smallest details.